Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, so uh, members, you're very welcome to the Executive Office Committee meeting. Um, if we could begin with apologies, item one, we don't actually have any apologies related to us. So hopefully everybody will make it along to the meeting today. Um, in terms of Chairman's Chair. business, uh, yes, Emma? Apologies. I should give apologies for Patchy and at the minute he has an appointment, so we can't make it. Oh, thank you. Okay, Emma, thank you for that. So if we could record that apology, please. Um, item two then, Chairman of Business, just to inform members that um, the Northern Ireland Youth Assembly has opened for applications on Monday the 26th of April and it will close on the 21st of May. It will see 90 young people. Um, obviously, Emma, you and I can't apply, although we are in the category of young people. Uh, but there's 90 young people aged uh, 13 to 17 are being sought for a two-year term to sit in a plenary twice a year and then to meet in committee a little bit more often than that. I know that whenever the Youth Forum and others with us, we had discussed the importance of youth engagement, um, young people being involved in democracy and decision making. And I think this is a really exciting way to have young people involved in that and feeling like they're part of the process. And hopefully uh, the Youth Assembly will be structured in such a way uh, their views and their thoughts will be captured uh, and relayed and, and provided to us at committee level to help us make the decisions that we're taking because uh, having young people involved in, in politics and in the decision making that, that impacts them is so, so, so important. So um, details are available at www.niyouthassembly.org and we would just ask everybody to encourage as many people as possible uh, to avail of those opportunities. So item three is the draft minutes. Uh, they are available in the meeting packet, page six. Are members content that they are a true reflection of the proceedings of last week's meeting? Okay. And we will get those signed and updated. Um, the no matters arising then at item four, which allows us to move to item five, which is the UK exit from the European Union, an oral evidence session with the junior ministers on Brexit issues. Uh, in the meeting pack on page 14 to 84 are the relevant papers. Uh, I could take the opportunity to ask for... Uh, junior Ministers Declan Kearney and uh, Gordon Lyons be brought up into the spotlight and to join us. And I can t then we'll have the other members moved into the audience. And I can take the opportunity to welcome the Junior Minister to the meeting today. You're very welcome. Uh, good to see both of you. And uh, maybe I'll pass over to yourselves to give us a presentation and an update, and then we can move after that to some questions. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. It's good to be with you again, as always. Um, we always appreciate the opportunity to uh, update the Committee on EU Exit Matters, and the Committee will have received a written brief that provides an update until the 15th of April, uh, and today, Minister Kearney and I will provide a further brief update. The most recent development has been, uh, as you'll be aware, the ratification of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement by the European Parliament. And as the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have said at JMCEN, it is essential that executive ministers are involved in the Partnership Council and that our officials are engaged in the relevant specialised committees that oversee the governance of the TCA. And we look forward to the proposals from uh, Lord Frost on the role of the devolved administration in those government uh, arrangements. When we last met with the committee, our focus was very much on business readiness, dealing with the issues as they arose and preparing for the end of the various grace periods. The UK government's unilateral announcements to extend the grace periods changed the landscape and context of our engagement and preparations. It did not, however, change the executive's key objective and one on which I believe we all agree that we should do everything possible to ensure the best outcome for our people and our businesses. We must ensure uh, that we use this time to support business readiness for any future agreed arrangements. Now, the committee will be aware of the ongoing discussions between uh, the government and the EU on issues associated with the protocol. These have included a meeting of the specialised committee on the 26th of March and most recently a meeting of the UK's co-chair 
of the Joint Committee, Lord Frost, and EU counterpart, uh, Vice President uh, Chefkovich, on the 15th of April. In separate statements published by the UK government and the EU, following that meeting, the co-chairs both acknowledged the number of difficult issues that remained and outlined their views on what is required. They did, however, both agree to continue discussions through the joint bodies established in the withdrawal agreement and to further engagement with our local business groups, civil society and other stakeholders. And uh, since that meeting, Lord Frost has met with businesses to hear their concerns. In addition, the Joint Consultative Working Group met for the second time on the 15th of April and the executive was represented at official level at the short meeting and the meeting focused on operational matters related to the exchange of information between the EU and UK. Since the end of the transition period, it has been a priority not only for our department but also for the wider executive to identify, uh, assess and seek to resolve issues that are having an impact on our businesses. We are also committed in our engagement at all levels to ensuring that those uh, in the EU and at Westminster understand our unique position and that agreed solutions reflect the concerns uh, that are raised by businesses. So we continue to engage closely with Westminster at a ministerial and official level on the wider issues impacting our businesses and communities, including through the UK government EXO meetings and the Brexit Business Task Force, which brings together ministers, officials, businesses and trade associations. Our officials remain in regular contact with the Trader Support Service, who have also been engaging with the various business sectors to uh, identify improvements to systems and processes which can help to decrease those burdens on businesses. And officials continue to raise our issues at regular meetings of the Whitehall Business Preparedness Group. We take and we continue to take every opportunity uh, to highlight uh, the need to resolve the many, many issues that remain uh, and to ensure uh, that we deal with those additional burdens uh, and costs for our people uh, and businesses. I want to hand over uh, to Minister Kearney. Thanks, Gordon. Can you hear me okay, Colin? Yes? Okay. Good to see you. Shewar Maha Sahan Danya, Om Tranona. Nice to see you all again today. As Gordon said, uh, the unilateral declarations uh, by the British government have changed the context of continuing preparations for the end of the grace periods that were set out. And as an executive, as well as preparing for the end of the grace periods, we continue to review the issues related to the end of the transition period as they arise. While the British government and the European Commission have identified a range of issues on which they are now engaging, officials are exploring the degree to which these align with those being considered by the executive, including specific issues such as the supply of medicines. One of the agreed priority issues of concern is the supply of medicines. The committee may have seen the recent media coverage in relation to this matter, and it is an issue which the executive has considered in detail recently. Since the end of the transition period, Department of Health officials have been working through medicine supply issues on a case-by-case -case basis, engaging directly with the companies concerned to ensure that our supply chains are not disrupted. We're assured that the supply of medicines issue is one of the priority issues that is being closely considered by the British government and the European Commission in the continuing discussions. We're continuing to work uh, with the department and the British cabinet office to ensure that long-term solutions are found to that and other issues. However, we are clear that any solutions to the issues raised following the end of the EU exit transition period need to reflect the practical impact and be developed in liaison with businesses who have been clear that solutions need to be simple, practical, and affordable. Alongside continued work in monitoring the delivery of EU exit related legislation, the Executive Office is progressing with the development of an IT system to track and monitor the legislation contained in the protocol and working with a cross-departmental working group to inform its design. Work in relation to common frameworks is also continuing 
On the 26th of March, the Joint First Ministers, in their roles as JMC ministers, gave final confirmation to the Hazardous Substances Planning Framework. That's the first framework that has reached the final stage, having been scrutinised by the relevant committees in all four legislatures. Committee scrutiny for those Stage 3 frameworks that have been approved by JMC ministers will now be impacted by the pre-election period for both the Scottish and the Welsh administration, the Welsh parliaments. The House of Lords Common Frameworks Scrutiny Committee published its report, Common Frameworks Building a Cooperative Union, on the 31st of March. And that report makes a range of recommendations for improvement to the Common Frameworks programme. And the British Cabinet Office are currently considering a response to that report. We are aware that as part of their stakeholder engagement, representatives of the Equality Commission and the Human Rights Commission discussed their work on the dedicated mechanism with this committee earlier this month. And we understand that the Equality Commission has now appointed a director and a number of permanent staff and work is underway to fill the remaining vacancies. Alongside that recruitment process, the Equality Commission has also commenced an engagement with the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission to progress all island oversight arrangements, as well as commissioning research, including on the impact of Brexit on equality groups. And I hope, Colin, that that provides you with a useful update on EU exit uh, matters at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, junior Ministers, that is appreciated. Thank you for that update. Um, and uh, I suppose uh, maybe it's of note that many of the issues have probably been politically a little quieter over the last period, but there's been a lot of depth and a lot of work that's been going on to try uh, and bring some resolution to the problems that are there. Uh, it's welcome to hear that certainly in terms of the businesses uh, and issues that they face, trying to move into that problem-solving mode and finding solutions is really important because that's what helps them, helps their business and helps them to be able to trade effectively. So uh, it's good to hear that there is a, a problem-solving approach being taken to, to the issues that are being identified. A couple of questions. Some of the issues you might have mentioned, but it's maybe just to probe a little bit deeper into the, the issues that were, were addressed. And I suppose one really is about the issue of the common frameworks, because um, it has been a somewhat maybe a physical long process with them. They were referenced away nearly a, you know, a year ago, and there was this huge body of work that was going to have to be undertaken uh, from a scrutiny level by the Assembly and Assembly Committees and this number of seven, 46 different uh, frameworks that seems to have been just right down to there only being um, three or four that needed to go through. And then we really haven't heard much of them. So could, can I get an understanding from yourself? Just where are we at in that overall process on a time scale with the common frameworks? And is there any impact upon, I mean, if the executive office maybe needs to sign off at those before they make their way up to the assembly to be scrutinized, are, are they parked somewhere or are they likely to make their way up to the various committees of the assembly to apply that important scrutiny role? Do you want to come on that, Gordon, or shall I? Uh, no, that's fine. I'm happy to, to go um, uh, on, on this one. So, yes, the, the common frameworks is um, uh, an ongoing issue, and, and uh, although I wasn't here um, at the last uh, meeting, uh, Chairman, because I was um, uh, otherwise detained elsewhere, um, I realised this was a, an issue um, that, that, that had been raised, and you'll be aware of the uh, House of Lords uh, common framework scrutiny uh, committee report uh, into that as well. Can update you and tell you that twenty common frameworks um, have been uh, approved by their respective departmental ministers, and they remain under consideration uh, for JMC EM provisional confirmation by the first minister. Um, the uh, deputy first minister and four frameworks are outstanding. They still need to receive clearance uh, from departmental uh, ministers and work is ongoing in the expectation that they will receive a provisional confirmation as early uh, as early 2021. 
Um, so overall, scrutiny has been impacted by the pre-election period in Scotland and uh, Wales. But work does continue on the uh, development of the common frameworks and particularly uh, preparation for scrutiny once those committees uh, are in place. Um, so I think it's it's fair to say that that will um, impact on the on the times for these all then to be to be considered uh, at together. But it's it's quite right that the committees in the assembly have their place uh, in relation to these as well. But I'm not quite sure for the individual frameworks what the what the time frame uh, for those are. Uh, I hate to give this answer in the very first question, but we can uh, try and get you additional information um, uh, on that uh, unless Declan has anything else uh, to add. Yeah, I, I read the, uh, the the House of Lords report, Colin, and I mean there's quite a legacy in relation to the uh, the British government, or perhaps better described as the English government's approach to the handling of the uh, the frameworks. Uh, it, it has caused quite a big deal of uh, grievance and annoyance on behalf of the Welsh administration and the, the Scottish administration. Uh, we, we went from a, a huge volume of identified uh, framework issues to it being reduced down. And I think, and the report I think does it quite well, uh, we have a situation where there's been a lack of transparency in relation to how these issues have been, have been moved through. Uh, I think that uh, the concept while good in itself, has been adversely affected by the length of time it has taken, by the lack of a transparency that has been applied in relation to how they have been progressed. Uh, arguably, the frameworks are, are being degraded in terms of their efficacy because of the, the failure at an intergovernmental relations level to ensure that uh, the Welsh, the Scottish and ourselves and uh, the, uh, the government and Whitehall are all on the same page. Uh, I, I do think that this needs to be moved on much quicker. And of course, as Gordon said, the, uh, the Shenad and the Scottish, the Holyrood elections are, are putting a pause on that. Uh, our side of the executive office have signed off on all of the uh, common frameworks that uh, Gordon has uh, referenced. So uh, on, on our side, uh, the, uh, the Deputy First Minister has signed off on those 20 frameworks. Uh, and uh, I think it's important that the, 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 they are finally signed off on, that, uh, that there is consensus within the Executive Office in order that uh, those uh, frameworks can be brought forward for the proper kind of scrutiny that's required within our own legislature, that we ensure that uh, there is no transparency deficit and that there's no democratic deficit arising as a result. Can I just clarify a point just that uh, I picked it up wrong? If you agree on the frameworks in the executive office, does that then go between the four regions that then for approval and once they approve it, it comes back to the committees or does it go to the committees of the assembly once you have agreed within the executive office? Well, in relation to those, in terms of the process as I understand it, while, while we have not signed off on those, uh, then that means that at JMC level there has not been uh, a complete sign off at that level among the, uh, the four administrations. Right, that's great. Right. But it all slows down the process. That's the, that's the problem. And it, and, it, and it feeds a perception of a lack of transparency. Okay, um, you made reference um, there to the Joint Consultant Working Group and, you know, it, it being uh, a forum, obviously, where if there are any changes that have been made uh, at EU law level that would impact uh, the North in terms of uh, results, that then we would need to be finding out about them and that the officials that were attending those, uh, what sort of officials and at official level are attending those and, and what sort of um, discussions have there been there so far? I mean, is, is there lots of changes coming down the line or is it just been very handful of changes or no changes yet? Or just about, about the impact that there would be from the decisions that have been taken and then updated through the Joint Consultative Working Group? 
So, as I said, um, Chairman, the first meeting took place on the 15th of April. That, I suppose, marked the start of the formal exchanges of information between the UK and the EU as set out in the, in the rules of, of, of procedure. Um, the executive office was represented. Um, the official was, was Lindsay Murr, who's the director of um, the EU division. And it was a very um, short meeting. It was operational uh, in nature. And um, uh, the main outcome was the agreement between the UK and EU co-chairs on operational conclusions, um, which covered uh, standing delegation lists and agendas for, for meetings, uh, etc. So um, it, it was really very... Um, uh, a first iteration of a meeting, really, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, we don't have a date yet for the next meeting, but it's expected to be in mid-May. Okay. And, and you've made reference then as well to the trade and cooperation agreement that it's been signed off and at that joint partnership council that, that really we need to get a seat at the table there to be able to, to provide that influence. And, and is, is it fair to say that you are putting as much pressure as possible to make sure that that's the case and, and are, you, are you getting a sense you're pushing an open door or uh, are you finding difficulty there? There's been consistent representation made on uh, the issue of participation at the Partnership Council and also where appropriate I think that there's as many as 19 other institutional mechanisms uh, that, that sit under that council uh, but where appropriate that we would either have ministerial or official uh, uh, representation. And I know that the Joint First Ministers have made those points uh, in joint committee, but uh, Gordon and myself have also raised that repeatedly at EXO meetings. Yeah, OK. I've seen that diagram, so it's all, it always strikes me that it's so um, important for some people that Brexit res resulted in less bureaucracy and administration. And so those 19 subcommittees of one partnership, uh, of one strand, have certainly helped to achieve that, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to pass on uh, now and to the, the deputy chair to Doug. Doug Beattie, if you want to ask some questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and, and Gordon and Declan, thank you again as ever for, for coming in and giving us a brief on, on what you can do. I, I have to say, um, and this is not your fault, I just don't get a sense <laughs> that, that there's much information to pass on to us. I get a sense that you give us what you have, and you give us it well, but I don't think there's anything there which we can actually grasp as anything concrete to say the issues that we have are being fixed. Uh, and I suppose the, the issue uh, is is the protocol and, and, and how we're going to either fix the protocol. And, and, and I get it that people are against it and some people are not. You know That's not the point I'm making. But how do we fix the, the practical problems of that protocol? Um, and I guess we haven't got there yet. Just reading your your report, that, that they're still in these discussions, and you know they're they're uh, highlighting all of the um, the very specific issues in regards to the protocol, and then looking for a work around on that. Therefore, I've, I've got to ask, and it's only a, I'm only asking for your sense of things, Gordon and, and Declan. I, you know, I, I don't expect you to to give me informed answers, but your sense of it. But is your sense that? We are genuinely tackling the protocol issues that we have and that come the end of the extended unilateral grace period that the UK government put in, which I, I think by, for memory is October, that there will be issues dealt with, it'll be dealt with by then, or do we think that the UK government may well extend the grace period which they've already previously extended. Is it, can I just get a sense of that? I'm sorry I haven't got a proper question, but it's just really get a, a better understanding. No, not at all, Doug. And look, to, to be honest with you, I think that's where a lot of people are right now. They're wanting to know, look, what's actually going to happen? How, how is this actually going to end up and how, how is it going to work out? Look, it's fair to say that there are different views within the executive office on this uh, as well. Um, I take the approach and um, I suppose this was impressed upon me even more during my time when I was um, temporarily DERA minister because I saw firsthand the problems that the protocol was causing, the very real problems that it was causing. Um, and I, I think we can't feel as constituency representatives as well um, to understand the frustration that's out there for many businesses as well because of the additional paperwork or bureaucracy or, or quite simply not being able to get product into Northern Ireland um, and the impact that that's having um, on them. So there are very real and very serious issues that I think people are experiencing right now. 
and mm -hmm. that's during the grace periods and um, I think we'd be very in a very very different situation if um, if that hadn't happened um, and that's why I think that we need to find permanent solutions um, to, to all of this uh, as well and look regardless of where you are on the protocol or not you know I would urge people to, to read what the protocol actually says and see whether or not what was promised is actually taking place so it says that the Belfast Agreement including its sub subsequent implementation agreements and arrangements should be protected in all its parts. There's concern over that. Um, the shared aim of avoiding controls at the ports and airports of Northern Ireland determined that the application of this protocol should impact as little as possible on the everyday lives of communities, have regard to the importance of maintaining the integral place of Northern Ireland in the UK's internal market, um, that the Union and the United Kingdom, the European Union and the United Kingdom, shall use their best endeavours to facilitate the trade between Northern Ireland and other parts of the UK. So I think in all of these things, um, the protocol isn't even working as those who designed it um, promised us um, that it would. And I, I, look, I'm of the opinion um, that it's not possible just to tweak this uh, around the edges. I think that there's a fundamental problem with the protocol. Uh, and that is that um, the UK, as far as Northern Ireland is concerned, is treated as a third country. And it's that very blunt instrument um, of treating the rest of the UK in the same way as which you might treat Russia or Somalia or, or Brazil. And that's what's causing so many problems for us right now and causing problems for our citizens. So it's not a bespoke solution. I don't think it does take into consideration the special circumstances um, of Northern Ireland. Um, uh, which which some have claimed uh, that it has. So, sorry, to, and I'm really supposed to go back to your question. I get the sense that people are starting to realise that. I get a sense that, that the government, um, and this is perhaps more from what I'm seeing in the media and seeing their actions rather than anything they're taking us telling us directly. But I think that there is a growing realisation of the problems um, that it's causing. And I think that we should all be willing to recognise that. I think we should say, look, there are problems here. How can we fix this? Rather than pretend that with a tweak um, here and there, we can fix the protocol, because in my view, we can't. Um, there, there are fundamental problems with it. And as I've said, that's my own personal view. That's not an executive office uh, view. Uh, and so now for something completely different, I'll hand over to Declan. Can I just jump in quickly? And Declan, I know you'll have a different point of view, and there's no issue here. I mean, this is really important that we explore all of these views, so I have no issue here. But but it is interesting, and you raise a really good point, um, Gordon. Because, I mean, I listened to to a, a, a West Belfast community worker a couple of days ago who was talking about um, the cost of living for her, that her shopping has gone up £15 a week since the protocol has come in. So actually, no matter which side of the coin you're on here, whether you're pro protocol or where you're anti-protocol, that the reality is that if it's harming our our citizens in that manner, then then something has to be to be done. So there is a practical side to, to all of this, no, no matter whether there's a political aspect to it or not. But listen, Declan, sorry, I, I, I know I'll get I, your, your view. Yeah, sorry, if you don't mind, Declan, if I can just, just come in on, on, on that point, because I think it's important to highlight that, in fact, ironically, this isn't an orange and green issue. Because it's not as if nationalists buy all of their goods from the Republic and unionists buy all of their goods from the rest of the UK. That's not how things work. We're, we're all impacted by this. And um, I don't think anyone can deny the impact that's there. So, you know, let's try and find something that, that, that is working. Because what we have um, now, in my view, isn't, isn't working. Apologies for, for cutting in there. Thanks, Doug. And... and from my perspective, uh, the, the genesis of all of this is Brexit. Uh, and uh, Brexit has never held out the prospect of a good situation for any of us. Uh, and and uh, regardless of what side of the community we come from or, or what political perspectives that we have. Uh, so the protocol is in place in an attempt to deal with the worst effects of uh, Brexit. And I think there are difficulties. But I mean, what comes to mind for me when I think of Brexit and the, the attempt to mitigate Brexit is you're trying to actually make a silk purse out of a sow's ear and the sow's ear is, uh, is Brexit. So are there difficulties? Yes, uh, I hear what you're saying about the, the, the cost to consumers for sure. 
there are issues clearly in relation to uh, veterinary and agri-food issues. There are issues pertaining to medicines, as I indicated. We don't have a solution in relation to, to steel. Uh, and uh, there's this outstanding issue in relation to fat on cars. But Gordon touches on the point of uh, a third country status having been created. That's as a consequence of, of Brexit. That's why we're dealing with those systemic difficulties. Now what we need to do is to find a way of, of dealing with it. Now, I think that from the very get go, and particularly, I think this has characterized the last period of months, uh, there's been a lack of candid conversation uh, on, the, on the part of the, uh, of, the, of the English government. And I use the term deliberately to distinguish between ourselves and the Scottish and the Welsh. I think that there's been a very English centric approach taken by uh, Boris Johnson's administration. But there's been a lack of candid conversation with the European Commission. I think that's fundamentally at the heart of the difficulties. If we're not getting conversations based on trust, then mistrust is going to be fueled. And then the ability to find the room for manoeuvre to identify solutions to these difficulties is, is inevitably going to be undermined. I found it very interesting to listen to Ivan, uh, Ivor Rogers, who's the former uh, British government uh, EU uh, ambassador speak about the absence of trust and the, the fact that he saw an increasing lack of trust. And indeed, since uh, Michael Gove handed this brief over to David Frost, the probability of a much more confrontational approach being taken towards the negotiations. And uh, he wasn't in a wet week until we then had the unilateral action being taken uh, by the British government in relation to the the grace period at a point in time when Simon Coveney was telling us that the European Commission was actually warming up to a discussion about actually finding those kind of mitigations and potential extensions. So I think you have to come at this from the perspective of trust. There needs to be a meaningful engagement. It has to be a two-way street, Doug. And Maros uh, Shevkovich said this last week, that uh, he's up for finding pragmatic solutions and flexibilities. And he has to speak for himself, but I'm reporting to you what, uh, what was said at the time. He accepts that there needs to be a minimized approach to protocol disruption, that checks can be uh, made smoother uh, through uh, looking at how the controls can be removed on the basis of agreement, which respects established standards in relation to food protection, cytosanitary controls, and other measures that relate to food safety and uh, public health and animal welfare. Now, I don't think that is beyond anyone if the trust exists and the willingness is there to actually find models to address those issues. But I do think that there's a requirement on the British government to recognise that if there's going to be a way of finding a permanent solution on cytosanitary issues, on, on those veterinary and agri-food issues, then it's going to have to accept that there's a need to, in that particular area, adopt compliance with EU standards. And the Swiss have done this. The Swiss have accepted a compliance with EU standards, and that's why that particular issue does not apply as a difficulty uh, in, in that particular instance. So I do believe that it's possible to find ways of removing and not just minimizing the disruption, but the trust issue is going to have to be addressed. I would actually point you towards an article uh, which, which, I was, uh, which I had my own attention drawn towards uh, just last week. Uh, it's a good piece written by a guy called Anton uh, Spisak in the Tony Blair Institute. Uh, the, the article is... Uh, Three crucial steps to make the protocol work. And, and it's a useful read because I do think it deals with the issue of trust and it also touches on some of the points that I've just mentioned, Doug. So, okay, uh, listen, Declan, um, Gordon, thank you very much for that full answer. I'll, I'll not keep you anymore. I'll hand back to the chair. Thank you for that, Doug. Maybe, uh, Junior Ministers, maybe in a word more than a, a, a full answer, is a sample record being kept 
of the problems that are being identified as a result of the protocol because, and I'm certainly not passing this as a comment in a way what's been said, but if we make reports that it's cost more money for your this and more money for that, and it's going to cause inconvenience here and inconvenience there, there will, of course, be the other side, which is there's many members that won't be getting an awful lot of representations of people coming to them and say that there are many problems. But is, is there a central list that's been saying, here's the identified problems that we can see, and then you can move into the next stage of problem solving? Or are we just at a stage of identifying problems? Well, as I said in my, in my opening remarks, we have identified them, assessed them, and then tried to, to action them to see, to see what needs to be uh, done. And uh, I, you know, we, I think in, in most departments, many departments anyway, we're certainly um, getting those those complaints. I can assure you, when I was in Dera, um, my box was full of them um, every single day of, of varied issues that people are are facing. Um, so yes, it's absolutely the case that, that those are being um, identified, assessed, and and then see what can be done. Okay, okay that's fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, and next I'm going to ask for uh, Trevor Lund brought up into the uh, spotlight to ask his questions. So we'll pass to yourself, Trevor. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to the two junior ministers for their answers so far. Uh, unilateral extension has been mentioned a couple of times, and uh, Doug mentioned that the possibility that the British government might actually unilaterally introduce a further extension if things don't go their way in the next few months. Uh, but we're, the British government is already under legal action from EU for doing the first unilateral extension. So do you, do you think it's feasible that they would have the, the neck to um, introduce a further extension in the circumstances? Um, well, the, the turbulence of the last period of months, uh, Trevor, uh, that can't be discounted as a, as a possibility. That said, uh, the, the last discussions between Maros uh, Shevchovich and uh, David Frost, did it seem uh, bring about a slightly better atmosphere, uh, notwithstanding the fact that that unilateral action and then the, uh, the threat of legal action by the EU uh, sat in the backdrop? Now, the British government have been given an opportunity to, uh, of, of, of an additional month uh, in relation to that matter. Uh, they've been asked for uh, a roadmap. It wasn't a roadmap. It, it, it apparently took the shape of a work plan, which didn't meet the expectation that had been discussed. I think we're in territory where tr trust is absent, where anything can happen at this point in time. But what we need to do, I think, is move away from the, the megaphone diplomacy and ensure that the, the joint committee uh, and the specialised committee knuckle down to finding the permanent solutions within the context of the protocol and on the basis of sensible levels of trust, providing the solutions that are causing difficulties at this particular point in time. I think it's time to set aside megaphone diplomacy and, and threats and uh, actual use of unilateral action and uh, buckle down at this particular juncture. The issues are well enough rehearsed now, and I think that there's a need for movement on both sides within the framework of the protocol to find the permanent solutions that are needed. I suppose to answer that, Trevor, my own view would be uh, I don't want to see an extension because I would rather see a solution um, to the problems that we are uh, facing. And though if that solution is not coming about, um, if we don't have further extensions, and then there, there will be serious consequences here in, in Northern Ireland. And um, it's already been made clear to us that uh, we would struggle to cope um, to, to keep in with the regulations and to do everything that we're meant to be doing. So I want the focus to be on finding that solution, to finding that alternative, um, rather than um, these continuous extensions, which in, in and of themselves create a degree of, of uncertainty. And um, you know the solution needs to include that free movement um, of goods um, between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which are intended for Northern Ireland and which have little to no chance 
or are at little to no risk of going into the um, Irish Republic. And that is where pragmatism can actually come in, that people are prepared to realise that a lot of the, the, the products and uh, a lot of these concerns, which will be going through 100% checks, will never end up within um, the European Union. And um, that's the type of prag pragmatism that I would like to see. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for that, Chair. Just one more quick one here, because uh, already been mentioned the situation around steel products and uh, secondhand cars. In one case, tariffs, and the other VAT. Uh, I could mention pets and soil, but we'll not we'll not go there for now. The, I understood from Michael Gove actually way back in January that the this question of uh, tariffs on steel had been sorted out. Um, I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong that currently, because we're in a transition period, tariffs are not being charged on the imports of steel here. But as we approach the end of the transition period, it seems as if it still hasn't been sorted out, despite the assurances given by a senior member of the British government. And I think perhaps the same applies to VAT and second-hand cars. So I know it's difficult for you to comment on specific, but where do we stand with those two particular items? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right that you uh, raised those, and that's something that both Declan, myself, and other ministers had raised um, frequently in, in January at our daily XO uh, meetings, and we have uh, pressed the government on the second-hand car issue for um, for a resolution for quite some time. And um, my understanding is uh, the latest position is that discussions are continuing between the, the government and the EU Commission on, on a long-term agreed uh, solution. Um, I, I think it is right to say that it was... It was put across that that issue had been sorted out, um, but it seems as if that, that is not the, the case. Um, in relation to uh, steel, um, again, we need that long-term solution uh, to the problems that are there uh, in terms of quotas and tariffs. Um, there, there, there has been guidance that has been issued, but it's not entirely been, been dealt with, and it's, um, it's something that, that we continue to raise um, with, the, with the government. Okay. Fair enough. Thanks very much. Yeah, continue to oh, on those on those issues, Trevor. But I I think it's in terms of painting the context, uh, there would be a, a European Commission perception that London knew what they had negotiated, uh, but then didn't do anything about the detail. So we have we have had a situation where uh, there's been a, a combination of mixed messages, uh, giving the impression that certain things were sorted out when in fact they. Uh, they're, they're yet to be finally resolved. Uh, and from the perspective of a multilateral institution like the European Commission, it's not going to understand uh, the impact of issues like that within our region on, unless they hear that information very clearly and precisely. And I don't think that uh, those issues were properly bottomed out uh, by the, uh, the British government negotiators. They, they conducted a negotiation with their eyes wide open because they wanted to achieve Brexit. But I think that they fell well short of bottoming out the detail on a number of these issues uh, that clearly would have implications. And now we're living with the consequence of that. Uh, I suppose on, on one positive side in relation to the process of all of this, it is about uh, recognising that if there's been mistrust to date, there's no need for the process to be based on trust. And I think that we also need to have a much tighter engagement with the European Commission so that they hear from us firsthand the effects, the negative effects that some of these problems are having in order that they become much more sensitised and conditioned to the need to finding solutions. Because some of this may well actually apply if they can be convinced to changes in relation to European law. But I think their expectation in turn would be, the flip side of that, would a much higher standard of compliance on behalf of the British government for the terms of the uh, protocol and its implementation. Indeed. Well, thanks for that. It's uh, certainly not the first time I've had assurances from the British government which didn't stand up in any shape or form. So hopefully they'll improve. Thanks very much, guys. Okay, thank you, Trevor. I wouldn't hold your breath on that one, but we're going to pass on next now to uh, Martina Anderson and ask Martina to be brought up into the spotlight and pass over to herself for some questions. Martina. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Declan and Gordon, for your attendance today and the information sent by the officials to the committee. Um, I think it's quite significant that you are here on the day that the European Parliament's 660 MEPs voted in support of the post-Brexit um, deal, uh, which includes the protocol. So I was unclear, Chair, when I listened to the answers to the questions that you had raised around the common framework. So if you don't mind me going back just to unpack some of that. Um, Gordon, uh, it was in relation to yourself because I was clear that Declan had said that the DFM side had cleared the 21 frameworks and when she talked about the depart departments and the committees maybe engaging with the others and I wasn't sure if you had said that the First Minister had cleared them and I'm asking if if, if, if not, um, this is part of any five-point plan from the DUP that you won't legislate on anything to do with Brexit? Uh, no, I, let me just re repeat. Um, I had said that the 20 of them have been approved by respective departmental ministers uh, and they remain under uh, consideration for JMCEM provisional confirmation um, by the first uh, and uh, deputy first uh, minister. I, I don't have that list in front of me, uh, Martina. I'm not sure which ones are, are still uh, outstanding. Um, it's not something I've been directly uh, involved in. Um, but as I said to the chairman, I'd be happy to provide further information on that. No, I, I can understand and appreciate your clarity there. But Gordon, I'm still confused because I thought that Declan had said that the deputy first minister had cleared them for GMC consideration. Are you saying that you, at your end, that the first Minister hasn't done yet. Um, I'm, I'm going to be um, uh, honest with you, as I hope I always am, and say uh, I'm not sure um, where those are at uh, right now um, or, or what the issue is. Um, as I said, it's not something that I've been uh, dealing with um, uh, directly, and I wasn't aware um, that, the, that the DFM um, side had um, uh, approved uh, those. So I'm not sure um, why, why that is uh, at this moment in time. Declan, could you confirm that you have confirmed that my understanding, what you said, was that the Deputy First Minister had cleared them, yeah, all 21? Yeah, we have signed off on them, including the, uh, the equal treatment common framework. Okay, okay. Well, maybe, Gordon, you could perhaps find out from your end why uh, there's a hold-up or why they haven't been cleared by the First Minister's office and maybe inform the committee of that. Um, I appreciate the fact that, you, that you're not uh, across all of the detail of these things. Could I ask both just one other question in relation to checks and controls at the ports? Um, because my understanding is uh, George Usage has, um, has sent notification to, uh, to Minister Putz that the checks and controls have to be put in place and he's inquired, required to put them in place. Now, Gordon, I know uh, you have already been in that position uh, for a short period of time, but you, you certainly... Uh, had something to say around checks and controls when you were there. So could we get an update as to where that's at? Because uh, I believe that the Minister Puts would be at least informing you or engaging with, uh, with the office, executive office, as to where he is at with that instruction. Uh, yes, well, it's my understanding, um, quite rightly, a lot of um, uh, members in the executive um, believe that these issues are cross-cutting, significant and controversial, uh, and therefore need to be brought to the uh, executive and um, it is the case um, that that's what um, uh, Minister Putz will, will, will have to do uh, uh, on these issues and an executive agreement then um, will need to be sought uh, for um, any substantive uh, issues there that, um, that, that need, to, need to take place. Um, okay, Declan, I don't know if you have any comment on that. It's not the se it's not the first time that uh, George Eustace, the Deferent Minister, has intervened. It's mm -hmm. the second time I think that he's corresponded with the Dairy Minister, asking him to meet his obligations under the terms of the protocol to ensure that the necessary BCPs are put in place and that the infrastructure is completed. Um, okay, well, Chair, that'll be me. I'll leave over to uh, to the rest of the members to ask the question. But I do think we need some understanding about um, if we have the DFM signed off on the twenty one common frameworks, then we need the FM to sign on so we can get these moved forward. Okay, thank you, Martina. And Gordon, just to confirm, even by a note, that you're going to come back to us now, right, and let us know where we are with that. Uh, I'm happy to, to check out and, and, and see where uh, things are and if, if, if um, 
uh, I, I'm not entirely sure of the of the processes and um, uh, whether we make comment on individual papers and, and who signed off and what, but um, uh, you've, re you've raised the issue and I'll certainly take it back. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Okay, can we ask uh, Emma up next for a question and we'll pass over to yourself then, Emma. Thank you, Chair, and I want to start by thanking both of the Ministers for joining us this afternoon. My question is directed towards Minister Lyons. Um, Gordon, I know that you yourself declined to attend two NSMC meetings, and we've learned today that the NSMC meeting that was scheduled to discuss agriculture matters had to be cancelled because your party colleague, Edwin Pitts, refused to attend it. I just wondered if you'd clarify if you agree that this is a time when we should be having increased North-South cooperation to uh, deal with the, the matters that are arising as a result of Brexit and, and everything else that's going on in the context of this year? Well, Emma, look, it's certainly the, the case um, that the protocol has brought with it the additional uh, difficulties, and uh, I have no problem uh, in engaging uh, with others. We've done that on the basis of, of East, West and, and North, South uh, as well. Uh, in, in the past, but we, we want to make it uh, very clear. Of course, this is an executive office. Uh, this isn't an executive office view, um, but that it can't be be business uh, as normal uh, because we have um, the situation uh, right now where there has been this disruption to to east west uh, relationships, um, and uh, we are we have said that we're not going to be partaking. Uh, in Brexit discussions um, uh, at this time um, on a on, on, on a north south uh, uh, basis, um, but where the real um, imbalance, where the real problems are uh, right now, is the is the east west relationship. That's the one that has been disrupted, and that's where the uh, that's where the problems um, currently exist. Uh, in in my opinion, and, and, and those need to be uh, fixed, uh, and those need to be to be dealt with as well. Chair, if I could just come back, Minister, with respect, you've contradicted yourself there because you have said that you will engage after uh, assuring me or, or giving rationale for decisions not to engage. So the problems that you've referred to, and there are problems for all of our constituents, but I would again ask you if you, if you don't agree that it is important at this time that we're all talking and conversing and trying to figure out solutions to the problems that or constituents and the people we represent are ringing to us. Oh, sorry, apologies if I if I wasn't clear. I'd meant that the uh, east west is the is the relationship that's been damaged, and, and and that's what needs to be that's what needs to be dealt with. Uh, of course, I do think that there needs to be recognition um, from the European Union and from the Republic of Ireland of the problems that the protocol has caused. Uh, we need to understand uh, how that has affected relationships and how it has um, affected our, all of our constituents as well. And how this is all um, uh, worked out. So, um, what I want to see is solutions um, to that. But before we get our solutions, we need to recognise that there's a that there's a problem uh, in the first place. Thanks, Chair. I mean, again, if you want others and partners, whether it be across the island or elsewhere, to understand your perspective and understand the problems that you're being faced with or the issues that you think have been have derived from the protocol, I would say that these are problems that have been caused by Brexit. You're not going to be able to put your point of view across if you're not going to talk to people. So I, I'm at a loss as to understand that perspective, to be honest with you. I, I leave it there from, from me. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, and certainly it's uh, easy to echo those remarks. I worked with children for and young people, teenagers, for many years. That any time there were issues or problems, we always taught them to sit down and talk it out and raise up what the problems and the issues were. Um, so it seems unusual to just avoid attending things and not discussing things as a way of trying to find a solution. Um, so I hope that we can revisit that and, and try and find. As I said at the beginning, that problem solving, uh, the mode is where we need to be. Uh, that's really about identifying the problems, discussing it, and finding solutions. Ministers, nobody else has indicated from the committee that they wish to speak, so uh, almost bang on the hour, on time today. We have um, completed uh, the session with yourselves. Thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, we look forward to seeing you uh, again in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Colleagues, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Go on, my good.
key numbers maybe with it being uh, on just slightly under the R uh, with your indulgence we'll maybe just move on rather than taking a break um, and see if we can move on just to our, our next session maybe just to, to double check if there's any outcomes from that last session I think we do have that letter or that update that we would like to receive from um, from from Minister Lands. Um, I see Trevor and then Emma maybe with something good yourself, Trevor Clark, of course. It's actually not any outcomes, Chairman. It's actually, I should have said at the very start, we, George, had asked me to put in an apology for him today. Um, I'm oh. not sure, but he just asked me to apologise at the start of me and I omitted to do that. Oh, that's grand. Thank you, Trevor. That's appreciated. Thank you. We'll record that then in, in the minutes. Um, Emma, did you have, you, you wanted to come in there? Yeah, it was just uh, one other comment that I I would appreciate clarification on, and I think we should we should note it for the record that I mean previously the the DUP leader said that it wasn't their policy to disengage on north south basis. It appears from the the past number of weeks actions that that policy has now changed, and it seems that Edwin Pitts is, is reinforcing that, and uh, the the Minister Lyons didn't distance himself from that today. So I I, I think we sh we should note that and and ask for clarity on that. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe we can ask by the, the, the demo for that, um, Michael, just to get some update on just what the reason was for that non attendance. And uh, I certainly would say it's pretty obvious to most people that the DUP don't have their sorrows to seek at the minute, and maybe their people have other priorities. But we I think we should at least, uh, it would be good to find out just what was happening with that non attendance there. Martina, I see you looking to come in there. Uh, Chair, I didn't raise it because I, I, I actually thought there might have been more members coming behind me and I didn't want to hog the meeting. But the one thing I'm concerned about um, is in relation to the protocol, the British government, as far as I understand, is not funding the protocol in the way that it was promised that it would, as well as it not funding the replacement of European money here to the north and we've heard about the leveling out and you know the shared prosperity fund but yet there's nothing coming forward so it would be good to try to get some information michael if that was possible just in relation to all of those drop down funding streams uh, and where they are at and the implications of them not being funded funded for the executive Absolutely, very important issues there that will, a lot of grips on the ground will be very uh, considerate of for the funding streams that are coming to them going forward. So, yeah, we could get that, Michael, that would be great. Okay, well, members, then what we'll do, we'll move on then to our next presentation. Uh, we have um, Mr. Mark Bassett, who is Barrister at Law at the Bar Library, and Professor Colin Harvey from the School of Law at Queen's University, who have... Um, Prepared and written document that has been published on the EU. And it's both very welcome along today. Thank you for coming along and uh, give us an update on that report. And uh, if you're happy enough yourselves, I just wanted to give us a, a short presentation on the work we've done, and then we'll move into a question and answer session. Then I will allow us to be more in detail. If you're happy with that? Okay, th thank you, Chair, and, and good afternoon. Thank you. I'm going to start and my colleague Mark Bassett is, is going to follow on. So I just want to thank the Chair, Deputy Chair and Committee members for the invitation to provide a briefing to the Committee for the Executive Office today. We very much appreciate the opportunity you've given to address you and really our aim in this briefing is to assist all participants in these debates by offering an evidence-based assessment of key themes that fall within our areas of expertise. We've provided a written opening statement, which we hope is helpful to committee members. Our independent research report, the EU and Irish Unity Planning and Preparing for Constitutional Change in Ireland, was launched in the European Parliament in October 2019. We have given evidence on our findings to the Oireachtas Joint Committee on the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. The report needs to be read in the light of other work uh, that both my Mar Mark and myself have undertaken and legal and policy developments since we submitted uh, the report. We've included in Annex B to the written opening statement selected of examples of additional material 
that we hope will be of interest to committee members. Uh, committee members will note that we've written that material in as an accessible way as we possibly can in terms of responding and answering to questions around this process. Although the report was written some time ago, our core recommendations, many of which were addressed to EU institutions, uh, we believe remain relevant. Our emphasis in the document on planning and preparing for uh, constitutional change, uh, we believe has clearly informed the framing of the conversation and discussion since then. And we really want to reiterate again this afternoon that our contribution to the debate is intended to assist all political parties and all communities across these islands who are contemplating the possible implications of constitutional change here in line with the Good Friday Agreement. We've also included an Annex A to the written document extracts from relevant texts, which highlight the existing and established constitutional position. It's clear that Northern Ireland remains part of the UK and that that position will only change in the way outlined in the agreement and as reflected in domestic law, policy and practice in both states. In our view, nothing contained within the withdrawal agreement, the Ireland-Northern Ireland Protocol and the Trade and Cooperation Agreement alters the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. Really, our aim this afternoon is to focus on the main themes in our report, uh, with particular emphasis to what you'll all be aware is an intensifying debate about the constitutional future of the island. As committee members will know, this discussion is becoming much more detailed and much more focused. There are a proliferating number of civic and political projects and initiatives. In recent weeks, for example, we've seen Jim O'Callaghan TD, Fianna Fáil, and Neil Richmond TD, Fianna Gael, providing detailed thoughts on what future arrangements might look like for public discussion. This collective effort includes valuable work ongoing by colleagues within universities across these islands and beyond, and I want to acknowledge and commend that work, which I think will be useful to be drawn upon by the committee and its work going forward. We very much welcome these developments, many of which have started after we submitted our report. We encourage others, including this commi committee, to contribute to essentially our basic premise and starting point. Our view is that satisfactory advanced planning and preparation needs to take place before these referendums happen on the island. Now, whatever your view on the constitutional future is, and we're well aware that there are different views on that, there's merit in encouraging and supporting exploratory work on all the relevant possible outcomes. If there's going to be mutual respect, equal treatment, and parity of esteem for divergent constitutional objectives in this society, then relevant and appropriate contingency planning needs to be undertaken by the executive office and by ministers and their departments on all potential constitutional eventualities facing this region. Now, we are pleased to see what we believe is a widespread and growing acceptance of the need for sensible and responsible preparation and what appears to be a measure of convergence among some around a possible time frame for giving people a choice. As you'll be aware, the agreement contemplates Irish reunification following concurrent referendums in both jurisdictions on the island. The process is underpinned by international law and the promise of self-determination is a central feature of the constitutional arrangements of Ireland and the United Kingdom. Following Brexit, reunification is further recognised as a matter of international law in the without prejudice provision of the Protocol in Article 1. So the constitutional status of Northern Ireland will only alter in the way prescribed in the Good Friday Agreement. And the language of status change there refers explicitly to the option of United Ireland. We want to underline the point again for the committee today and following on from, from what we've heard uh, in the earlier session, uh, the constitutional status of Northern Ireland has not changed as a consequence of anything that has happened in the Brexit negotiations. Now, 
We have outlined elsewhere our preferred approach going forward and would draw the attention of the committee to the important and significant work of civic initiatives that we are involved in, such as Ireland's Future and the Constitutional Conversations Group. We have offered uh, publicly a view on what we believe a good faith interpretation of the agreement requires of this process, and we've provided further details in Annex B of our document. Uh, we may remain concerned at the minute uh, by attempts to erode and undermine key elements of the agreed process. Uh, and we also recognize that there are areas where more work is required to promote clarity and certainty. And again, the spirit in which we undertake this work is our continuing insistence on the need for necessary preparations that must be that must take place in advance of the refer referendums envisaged on the, in the agreement happening on this island. In addition to the work that I've just noticed, for example, I myself have also written, as many of you may be aware, to the Secretary of T State on a number of occasions in a personal capacity, seeking answers to detailed questions around his role in relation to the provisions of the Northern Ireland Act. I've thus far received three responses from the Northern Ireland office, uh, and just to note that a further response was received last week after the submission of the written uh, opening statement, and I've forwarded these to committee members. Essentially, like the other work I've noted this afternoon, the letters are an attempt to seek clarification of significant aspects of the referendum process and clarify the role of the Secretary of State. Uh, in our view, these are matters of preparation and planning and sensible management that are of interest to all political parties and all uh, communities here, and we hope you will find them of assistance and value. Uh, my colleague, Mark Bassett, will now take you through the rest of our opening statement, and just to thank you again for the invitation to for this briefing this afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Chair, and to the uh, members of the committee. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, both yourself and your colleagues for the opportunity uh, to speak today, present the report, and to take any questions on it. Uh, the focus of the report is for, um, uh, it really tries to look at Irish reunification uh, from the EU perspective. So the hope is that uh, those who are familiar with uh, the British and Irish constitutional law and the Good Friday Agreement uh, will learn, after reading the report, will learn something uh, about how this uh, issue is viewed uh, in terms of the EU law. And on the other hand, if it, it's also hopefully going to be assistance to EU lawyers or to uh, politicians in the European institutions that they uh, I'm familiar with the EU law, but we'll learn something about the, the Good Friday Agreements and how it's implemented and given effect in Irish and, and British constitutional law. The, Mark, the, sorry, Mark, I'm really you're having a very bad connection with yourself there. Oh, I do feel it maybe was just beginning to rectify itself towards the end there, but I think most members will have struggled to have picked up everything that you've maybe said so far. Could I suggest if we could go back to the start again, and if it does improve, we may need to, to just assess things? Uh, yes. Is that I'm, I'm certainly struggling with that. I think um, I don't think the connection is working with us there, Mark. Um, do you maybe oh, want to just take a second to, to log out and come back in again? And maybe we'll pass the column for just another minute, maybe to, to give us an update yes. and another few depth out again. That might give us a better connection. Okay, I'll, I'll do that now. Apologies. Colin, that's no pressure on you at all, but <laughs> uh, do you want to maybe just pick up some of some of the initial remarks maybe that Mark was going to give to us? Yeah. 
Yeah, there, Colin. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to do that. Really, ultimately, in our report, uh, we identify and explain likely consequences and legal processes that arise. And really, essentially, what we're arguing is that the responsibilities on both governments and EU institutions uh, to prepare. Um, in our view, the challenges are identified in our report, but none are insurmountable. And the managed transition to these new arrangements is feasible and achievable, if that is what people decide uh, here. Uh, our report examines, among other things, the Good Friday Agreement framework, the state of the current debate, the mechanics of reunification in an EU context, consideration of how British citizens will be accommodated, and issues such as the consequences of the current rules on economic and monetary union for continued Irish membership of the Eurozone. The report can, includes a number of suggestions and recommendations that are addressed to EU institutions in particular. As we hope is clear and as we've emphasised this afternoon, we believe that proper preparation is essential. Uh, the European Union will have an interest and a role in the process of constitutional change within one of its member states. And that's really the principal focus in our report. Maybe if I highlight some of the recommendations we've listed in the opening statement. We're inviting the committee to write to the executive office to request further information about any contingency work it has undertaken to plan and prepare for the potential of constitutional change, including where any of these questions have arisen within the mechanisms created by the withdrawal agreement. We're convinced, uh, and as we made clear in the opening statement, that legislatures have a role to play in the preparations. We're therefore recommending the establishment of an ad hoc assembly committee to examine the implications for Northern Ireland of the prospects for constitutional change across these islands, including Scottish independence, maintenance of the status quo, and the United Ireland. In the alternative, or in addition, a subcommittee of this committee could be established with a similar remit. We're under, we underline that such a committee would examine the consequences of all relevant constitutional outcomes, so would not be confined to exploring one option only. We recommend that it should liaise with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee at Westminster and the Oireachtas Joint, Oireachtas Joint Committee on the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, among others. We also recommend in our, report, in our statement that the Assembly Research and Information Service be asked to produce a comprehensive briefing paper on the work completed thus far in relation to these discussions and any gaps in existing research as they specifically relate to the Assembly and Executive. We also invite the committee to consider writing in the public interest to the Secretary of State to ask for answers to the questions that I've posed in recent correspondence. You may well all have more luck than me in getting answers to those. So I just want to thank you again for the invitation to discuss these matters this afternoon with the committee. We'd urge members to consider how this committee can assist and ask that you reflect on and discuss further work that might be undertaken by the Executive and the Assembly. While there's often an intense focus on the role of both governments in these processes, we believe that legislatures, committees such as yourself, must also consider how they can contribute constructively to proper planning and preparation and make sure that takes place in advance of the concurrent referendums that I hope we've made clear this afternoon, we believe are likely to be held in the decade ahead. So thank you again uh, for your, your time th this afternoon. I very much look forward to uh, your questions and also hope very much that today is the start of an ongoing conversation in the context of the, the growing amount of work that's being done in this area. So thank you again. Okay, Colin, thank you very much indeed, and welcome back to Mark. I can see that you've joined us again there. I hope maybe in the question and answer session, Mark, that we maybe can get some input from yourself. Can we just check your, your, your you can hear us okay? Uh, yes, Chair, I, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? Yep, that's a much yep. better connection with this so we'll definitely be able to get you dovetailed into some of the uh, answers, answering some of the questions then. So uh, thank you for, for that, Mark. Okay. Maybe if I could just begin um, and maybe just sort of highlight a few of the issues you referred to just to get a bit more um, sort of perspective on them. 
Uh, I suppose you, you, you referenced there, uh, and I, I accept we're very, very, um, very explicit in it that there has been no change to the constitutional um, establishment that is there uh, at the moment. But just what is your sense of the impact that the likes of Brexit uh, has had uh, on the question of, of unity? And sort of, do, do you feel that it has had uh, an accelerant impact on that debate and discussion? Um, and and, and is, has it been one of the key uh, changes on the landscape in, in, in this matter? Um, yes, sure. Uh, if I can address that. The, uh, it, it seems to us that, yes, the UK withdrawal from the European Union has been a, an accelerant to the uh, 2016 uh, EU membership was a neutral factor. Uh, the UK was a member state. Ireland was a, was a member state. Uh, there was a majority in this jurisdiction that supported continued UK membership of uh, the European Union. Uh, it, it wasn't enough uh, to, to, to win the Brexit referendum. Uh, but in the, we think in the years ahead, uh, there are concurrent referendums. Uh, the choice in Northern Ireland is going to be uh, between two outcomes. Uh, one is uh, Northern Ireland, part of the United Kingdom with Britain, outside of the European Union, but in a protocol, uh, probably this protocol, but in a protocol. Uh, and the other choice is for a United Ireland as a member of the European Union and uh, with the Irish state assuming those obligations on the sovereign power which is set out in the Good Friday uh, agreements. So, uh, there is also a question of uh, European Union citizens who have exercised free movement rights and taken up residence uh, in this jurisdiction and we would hope uh, that they would be included on the franchise uh, for a for the, for the referendum in the north and will be given an opportunity to uh, contribute to the decision of Northern Ireland whether they should be the United Ireland or the, the Union with uh, Britain should continue. Ch Chair, maybe if I just, um, uh, I think the, the spirit of our, our contribution this afternoon is, is the starting point is it would be odd to us if people weren't discussing this. Yeah. Uh, you, to address your question as a result of Brexit. Uh, obviously, one part of the island is in the European Union, one part of it is out of the European Union. There's a mechanism in the Good Friday Agreement there whereby Northern Ireland has a potential to rejoin the European Union. It would seem to be, seem to me, seem to us very, very strange if people didn't feel they could have this conversation uh, out loud, if you like. And so I think we've been very heartened by the amount of really rather, you know, tedious, boring technical work <laughs> that now has started around some of the hard questions. So in a sense, it's really pleasing to see that, that, that the homework bit of this is starting to be done, because I hope uh, committee members will understand, as we've made clear this afternoon, um, we want to see advanced planning and preparation done. So when I think the the, the view is the committee, uh, the assembly, and the executive can have role in that preparatory work. I think one of the things we try to underline in the opening statement is there are constitutional deb debates happening around these islands. So there's a sense in which we need to be ready for all potential outcomes. Obviously, there's a debate about this island, but look at what's happening in relation to Scotland. You know, how, how will the assembly and executive respond if there is constitutional change uh, there? So it seems to me that uh, Brexit has rather dramatically changed this discussion. It would be strange not to be talking about this, but that we need to do the hard work in advance first. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a fair point, and, and I suppose one of, uh, 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 and I suppose this moves into my next question because you mentioned, you know, on a number of occasions, and, and I totally agree that there is a lot of groundwork and a lot of um, preparation that needs to be done. In some instances, just to have the debate, the, the ground to have the debate, because I'm conscious that that we have three members of this committee that are from the DUP who have, who are not here. 
um, and and therefore, you know, I think we need, we have a certain amount of uh, work that needs to be undertaken to allow an arena where the discussions take place about the about preparations. I suppose maybe the question is, what, maybe could you give us a flavour of preparations? What sort of necessary preparations need to be to be taken? Um, I mean, I can think of see straight away that there there'll be fiscal matters that will be of great importance to people and and often uh, contribute to people's thinking in matters like this. And that may have been a key criticism of the Scots uh, referendum, that there wasn't enough work done in terms of the, the, the people feeling that they were going to be out of pocket. But, but what other sorts of preparations do you feel that would need to be taken uh, before we, we, we move into the discussions? Maybe just to start and then uh, Mark follow up as well is there's just two things, Chair, I think we need to think about. The first thing is procedural questions around uh, the the process itself. Um, and as you'll know, there's work ongoing at the moment around the concurrent referendums themselves and how those processes will advance. And while the Good Friday Agreement provides a framework for that process, uh, and there is a measure of clarity around that already, there's still gaps that need to be addressed. You know, Mark uh, raised the question about, for example, who gets to vote in Northern Ireland when the referendum happens. So there there are those sorts of procedural questions and it's really, really heartening to see that a lot of work has started on that already that we need to just flesh out. Uh, the second one is, you know, the more substantive one, uh, both ways. So if you're proposing in a referendum, that uh, the outcome be a united Ireland. Well, what's your proposition? What's going to be in your prospectus? When you turn up at somebody's door, if we're ever allowed to turn up at somebody's door again, you know, what are you going to actually say in a, in a referendum campaign? So the substance needs to be fleshed out. And I think there are a no number of options there in relation to those who are advocating change that need to be clarified. So I, I mentioned recent work, a number of politicians and others who have engaged in that debate. I think that's all very useful in sketching out, well, what does a united Ireland actually look like? What are the options? What are the choices? And what are the implications of the Good Friday Agreement for those choices? Because in some sense, it's not an entirely blank page, page conversation. You know, this will be framed by the agree agreement. I think also just to finish and uh, hand on to Mark is that there's a, there's a lot of focus on those advocating change in terms of a united Ireland. But also, of course, those arguing for the maintenance of the status quo also need to be thinking that when they develop their campaign literature, or the prospectus or the proposition, what will that be contain? Will it simply be, uh, here we are, uh, no change? Or will there be proposals there as well about what the maintenance of the union might actually look like? So I think procedurally, there's work going on around the question around the referendum. And then substantively, there's work going on around what, what does that actually look like when this uh, starts? And, and really to end where we started, we, we feel that we're on a pathway towards these referendums taking place. You know, in a sense, whether you necessarily like that or not, so that before they happen, we don't have a repetition of what happened around Brexit. People are prepared. They know what they're voting for. And then, you know, it is ultimately up to people to decide the constitutional future of this region. Thank you. And I'll pass your remark. Thank you. Uh, yes. In, 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 when these referendums do come, and we believe that they're, they're on the horizon, as you said, uh, we should all want a fair process and an informed and engaged electorate being presented with realistic outcomes. As Colin said, a lot of the kind of procedural questions uh, can be answered by reference to a current Irish and British law, uh, constitutional law, and uh, the, the terms of the the Good Friday Agreement. And the more substantive uh, points uh, on health, education, infrastructure, and uh, in the existence of two separate legal systems, and in particular the continuation of the institutions established by the Good Friday Agreement, and they will require further work, uh, principally from the Irish government, but not only from the Irish government. In the report uh, that 
Uh, we've also identified some work uh, which should be undertaken by the EU institutions. And some important work there would be uh, Ireland uh, is a member of the Eurozone. Uh, a reunited Ireland will have consequences for states on the under the you know, Union. And that should be examined. Uh, a lot of uh, the ways which exist in the EU are based on citizenship of the European Union. Uh, in a united Ireland, there will be a large number of British citizens resident in the, in the United United Ireland, the state. And we think that there's going to have to be at least some provision in EU law for not only protection for union citizens, but protection for British citizens uh, residents in Ireland. Uh, some of the other points that the EU institutions could look at is uh, Irish uh, representation uh, within the European Parliament and also within the uh, within the, the council also the, the role also of course going to come up I'm, I'm breaking up we got to start about uh, 30 seconds there where we move the pick up I'm going to move on to the next question. What I'm going to recommend, if you could possibly just use your computer to switch off your camera so that we only have my audio to see maybe if that improves the, the, the signal a little bit because we're, we're just unfortunately struggling to get what you're saying. What I'll do is I'll pass on next and ask Martina Anderson um, to, to ask a question and uh, we, we will hopefully, with just being on audio only, that might help Mark to get some of the quality back from, from what we're hearing from you. So I'll pass to Martina. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Colin and Mark. And it's a pity, Mark, that we're not hearing from you because I have had the pleasure um, of being with you when we launched the document that you're here to talk about today in the European Parliament about the EU and Irish unity. And then, like now, I'm, and I've observed the thread running through a lot of what you have to date uh, produced, as had many others, it's about encouraging a conversation. It's about prudent planning for constitutional change. And it's about ensuring that the constitutional turbulence uh, that, that we're in currently, insofar as uh, Brexit has had an impact, so it's about the, the EU statement on the, the 29th of April, when 28 member states, sometimes people, I think, forget that the British government was still a member state at that time. And it was one of the signatures to the statement, uh, which sent a signal to the people of Ireland, to people of here in, in the north of Ireland, that in the event of a democratic process and Ireland being reunified, then the whole of Ireland would remain in the EU. So it's, um, I think it's to try to pick up on, on what, uh, what Colin, you had said about writing to the executive office uh, in the here and now for, for the kind of planning and preparing. And I think for, for people uh, listening in, what would you envisage the executive office um, taking forward? You talked about, for instance, the establishment of an ad hoc committee which would be the a committee, um, whether we would get that or not would remain to be seen. I, I, I have my doubts, uh, but I do think it is something we should argue for. Um, but I would like to know and have you exploring with us further what you would see of the role of the executive office, notwithstanding the different various views from the, uh, for instance, uh, the two joint ministers in relation to this, but in the context of sensible, reasonable planning for a potential outcome uh, so that we never in a, we are never in a situation here in this island that we have the kind of referendum debate discussion and, you know, people being told that there's project fear and project this and, and all of that. It's a sensible, reasonable conversation about potential constitutional change. So could you explore that with me further about why you would like us to engage with the executive office? Uh, thank, thank you, Martina. 
again, the, 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 the recommendation around writing to executive office is twofold. One is to just clarify uh, what work or thinking has already been undertaken in relation to this uh, on the basis of the earlier point about it would be odd in the context of Northern Ireland having an option of returning to the European Union that nobody was planning or discussing that. Uh, and, and the second was to encourage the executive office and ministers and their departments to mainstream this within their planning processes in, in this sense that, uh, you know, if we respect some of the core values of the Good Friday Agreement or where we currently are now, then then essentially we should be planning for all potential eventualities. Now, I, I don't and we don't in the opening statement uh, simply point to one outcome, right? Uh, there's also the fact that Scotland may become independent in the decade ahead as well. Uh, and, and it strikes me in that context that the executive office, uh, our ministers and departments should be thinking about how we will be responding to some of those uh, developments. You know, Mark and I talked before this meeting is, you know, does, does the executive and assembly have a view about its own continuing existence? For example, the, these are some of the debates that are currently happening. And it seems to me that the executive should have a view on that. We also finally just in the recommendations that, you know, there are important research functions as well and capacity functions. And, you know, departments, the executive office could be thinking about the existing research that has been undertaken, research that is still to be done. I'm conscious, for example, of the potential for linking up with the shared island unit in a conversation about where that unit is exploring how we cooperate on the island in the here and now, that, that the executive office is engaging and thinking about that, both in the here and now and where it might be things might be going next, in the sense that I think people throughout the society would expect a government, its government and departments to be mapping forward potential constitutional and other futures. And it seems at least plausible to say that we're heading into a period of constitutional change. And uh, we'd want the executive office, we'd want government ministers to uh, be ready. Now, I, I know the re response, you know, I'm not naive, you know, it might be an academic, but I'm not, I, I, I know the reality of that. But, but just to let me reiterate what, what we started with, this is relevant for all political parties and all communities here that were prepared for the status quo and that were prepared for possible change and that, that were ready. And it seems to me that if we respect some of the values that are supposed to govern the society that we live in, that should be an utterly unproblematic statement to make. Mark? It's Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, th thank you, Colin. Just want to check that um, uh, the the committee is able to hear me. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And apologies for the difficulty so far. No, I, I was, would really only have said what uh, Colin has has already uh, set out. Uh, there are some kind of uh, kind of clear blue sky proposals out there about what a united Ireland might look like. Uh, we we think that the devolved institutions set out in the Good Friday Agreements, uh, unless and until something else is agreed, are going to be an important feature of United Ireland. And it would be helpful if the um, if the Assembly, or if, the, if this committee uh, could put forward a, a view on that, to, uh, either in support or, or in opposition to it. Uh, another useful uh, task that uh, the, this committee or the uh, Assembly's Research and Information Service could perform is that if it was able to identify uh, features of perhaps Irish constitutional law or, or Irish law that uh, may perhaps uh, not adhere to the principles of equality or parity of esteem, I think that would be helpful uh, to an Irish government for that to be pointed out uh, from this uh, forum. 
Can, can I ask, Chair, um, in relation to that's assembly, so um, thank you both for, for um, outlining your thoughts further on that. But can I ask, in relation to you've seen polls which have shown that there's a growing support for Irish unity, both north and south. So how beneficial then in the context of that conversation that you talked about in the planning and preparing would be the establishment of an All-Ireland uh, Citizens' Assembly just to assist with the conversation, to assist with that planning and preparing for potential constitutional change? I, well, Martina, just to respond to that, I think citizens' engagement in this discussion is absolutely essential. So, you know, I, I think the idea that's out there of establishing an all-island citizens' assembly or forum to discuss some of these questions, you know, it's proved to be remarkably a productive way of addressing issues uh, in Ireland, you know, in the south of this island. I think it's a, it, it's a good idea, essentially because as well, you know, I, I don't think answers to some of these questions should necessarily come from the top down. They should be bottom up conversations where the hard questions are addressed and emerged. I'd also just like to respond to something you've said. Part of the reason why, and I realize I've been writing letters to Brandon Lewis since December, but it's, there's two things there. Secretary of State is under a duty to act where it appears likely that a majority would would take this option. So there's a duty there to act, but also the Secretary of State could take this step essentially at any time you know, if he felt it was in the public interest, for example, to do so. So I think it seems to me that, 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 that not to be ready for that seems remarkably foolish, you know, and the responsible thing to do is planning. And if we're going to plan responsibly, you know, you know, citizens' engagement across this island in addressing some of the harder questions around some of the things we've talked about earlier is a great idea, you know, and something to be thoroughly supported, I would have thought. Thank you. Um, I'm someone who is a firm uh, firm believer in participatory democracy. Um, so the, a citizens' assembly and bottom-up, it's not. it should never be from top down. It should, we should always consult, hear, listen, and, and the, the co-design process that some people talk about now, uh, whether it's policy development or constitutional change, that's absolutely necessary. But I'm also conscious of the report that you're presenting to, presenting to us today, and it was the EU in Irish unity. So given the role that the EU has played um, in terms of protecting the Good Friday Agreement and all of its parts, no hardening of the border and the unique and special circumstances, and I know both yourself, uh, Colm and Mark, have identified that the Good Friday Agreement and all of its parts um, also deals with the issue of rights. But I'm going to leave that to Emma because she will probably pick up um, she's the chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on the Bill of Rights. But I would like to ask you, what do you, would you envisage the role of the EU uh, playing in the planning and preparing? And as we move forward, some of us believe, to a constitutional conversation about uh, a changed future in this island. I'm going to let Mark, I think, if you want to start with that one. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Uh, the, we, we, in the report, we take as uh, a starting point the un unanimous decision of the European Council that uh, Irish uh, reunification would be approached by the institutions in, in the same way that German unification was in 1990. So the, the EU institutions are going to view it as consistent with public international law. Uh, they can see that there's a process for reunification, both in uh, provided for in the Good Friday Agreements, but also in Irish constitutional law and the UK constitutional law. And uh, one of the important steps after that would be to make sure that the institutions themselves are uh, ready for a united Ireland. Uh, one of the things we've mentioned in the report is a, a study of the implications for Ireland's membership of the Eurozone. So that there are there's a single monetary policy, and but there's 
coordinated economic policies between the member states. So it would be helpful if there was a, a view and, and research undertaken in the EU institutions. And the other issue that we address in the report is the status of British citizens in a united Ireland. Uh, it's a, a fundamental feature of the Good Friday Agreement that uh, British citizens would be entitled to that status in perpetuity. Now that will be based on British nationality law, but there has to be uh, effective protection built into Irish law, but we think also probably in EU law also, so there will be some sort of category uh, conceivably of uh, British citizens in Ireland would be afforded uh, equivalent rights to EU citizens. So that would be free movement, data protection, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, other uh, measures that could be taken uh, within the EU institutions, uh, again, would be uh, research on, on rights issues uh, and on uh, the economic uh, consequences for, for United Ireland. Maybe if I just uh, very quickly mention uh, that, uh, just to echo what, what Marcus said, but obviously this will be a process that will be happening within a member state of the European Union. Uh, you, you'll note in our report, our recommendations are primarily addressed to, for example, the European Parliament and the European Commission and other institutions. We think that the European Union has a significant interest in what will happen in one of its uh, member states. And so uh, the preparatory work that we're recommending in the report could also be undertaken, I think, unproblematically by the European Union in advance of that. And also I think what's often neglected in the debate is that anything that happens in, on this island will be a responsibly managed transition process of change that will enjoy, I think, the support of the European Union and other international actors as well, and will take place over time too. So again, just to re repeat the point, we think just like we've talked today about the work of your committee, that the institutions of the European Union could be doing useful work in advance of this taking place. Thank you. Okay, Pierre, thank you. Look, there's loads of questions I could talk to, to both of you or listen to both of you. Uh... For, for for a long time and sort of would love to ask you more questions, but Chair, I, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks very much for that, Martina. Can I ask for Trevor Dunn to be brought up next for his question, and we can then pass over to Trevor. Yeah, hello, Chair. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, thanks, Colin and Mark. It's, it's great to see you before the committee. Um, I think this has been very useful so far. Um, you mentioned the... Uh, you made the recommendation about an ad hoc committee of the assembly to look at this, and also Martina has rightly brought up the question of a citizens' assembly. Would, would you agree with me that there's that, that those two organisations working in tandem, one perhaps from a political point of view and the other from a more civic point of view, should be able to establish answers to the questions that everybody wants to know? I think particularly the citizens' assembly in a non-political atmosphere could could be asking the questions about the economy about the health service the police all the rest of it and garner the answers and put them before the people because you rightly say in paragraph 12 of your uh, report it's essential that everybody has the information and knows what what the issues are and it, it'll inform how they vote and that, that leads me on to the other point i'll make that, uh, that there's no unionists here today um I imagine they're watching, but they're not here. Uh, they're, let's say, they're adopting an, an abstentionist attitude rather than a boycott, because apparently they don't do boycott. But uh, the, the point I'm making is that the, the, we have this conversation, we have your report, we have the others you reference, Colin, Ireland's future activities, uh, the one from Jim McCallaghan, and most recently, I think, the one from Neil Richmond, all of which are valid and very useful. But they, you'd have to form the opinion that they're all directed and, and without perhaps meaning to in one direction, that would be towards Irish unity. 
So surely it's, it's absolutely vital, and maybe we could put it on the record today, it's absolutely vital that we do hear from unionists as well and get a unionist point of view, because they're absolutely as much entitled to make the case for, for the continuation of the union as people like us are to make the case for reunification. So what, what would be your comments on that? Thank you very much, Trevor. Again, just to agree with you around the important role of the Citizens' Assembly uh, in shaping the debate, uh, dealing with some of the harder questions, but also, you know, we've seen Citizens' Assembly being forums whereby you, you receive expert evidence, you tease out the issues, they're discussed with people, and conclusions are then reached on a sort of informed basis. And I think it's a very, very useful model that would be very, very helpful. Uh, next thing is, look, in some senses, the preparatory work is on is already started and is ongoing. So in a sense now, it's about people joining what is already work that's ongoing to flesh out the details, much of which has been done in university context, but a lot of which has been done in wider civil society as well. But on, on the point of wider engagement, I hope it's been clear to the committee members today. We've underlined in our opening statement and in everything we've tried to say today that this is of interest to all communities in this society and all political parties. We have framed some of our recommendations around contingency planning quite deliberately because we need to be ready for all eventualities and outcomes. And, and obviously one outcome is maintenance of the status quo as well. And we need to think about that. Why? Because you'll be aware that there are people within the UK at the moment who are, who are making proposals about what the UK might look like in 10 years time. So we need to tease those out too. We're seeing the debates that are happening in Scotland and Wales. We're seeing debates about decentralization even within England. It seems to me it would be of enormous value if a dedicated mechanism within the assembly for for the best interests of everyone in this society would tease out some of the implications of that for Northern Ireland. So, you know, in no sense are we saying that would be a conversation only about a united Ireland, although I think that work needs to be done. It would be a conversation about whether the assembly and executive is prepared and ready for all constitutional eventualities uh, that, that might happen around these islands and seems to me almost impossible to deny. Um, just to end where I start, absolutely want all political parties involved in the Assembly to engage in that conversation and should be warmly welcomed and invited to participate as well. Thank you, Trevor. Yes, indeed. Uh, sorry, Mark, did you want to? Yeah, yes, sure. Thank you very much for the, the question. And to, just to point out, one of the uh, suggestions made by Neil Richmond in his recent paper was that a, th there would actually be a kind of a formal relationship between a citizens' assembly on the island of Ireland and a number of parliamentary committees. So there would be initial suggestions from a citizens' assembly that would then uh, be commented upon by the executive committee in Northern Ireland by the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee in uh, London and by the uh, Oireachtas Good Friday Agreements Implementation Committee. Uh, those comments would then come back to the Citizens' Assembly and ultimately a recommendation would be made in, to the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin and to the Northern Ireland Secretary of State. So that, that, that's one suggested model in which the Citizens' Assembly and the and, uh, Kind of formal institutions are, are working together. Uh, on the other point of, of unionist uh, engagement and participation in this debate, it would be very welcome. Uh, it would be very helpful, uh, but it can't uh, prevent responsible planning from being from taking place uh, at this time. And uh, the, the, in my view, the the, the only uh, legitimate basis for Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom is at the moment the assumption that there's a majority of the people of Northern Ireland want that to be the case. Uh, so that's no longer a completely safe assumption, uh, particularly in the context of U UK withdrawal from uh, the European Union, that there may well be a majority already uh, in this jurisdiction if the question was posed in terms of do you wish to achieve uh, sorry do you wish to return to European Union membership through Irish unity and uh, that that may get a, a majority vote 
Uh, I suspect that one, if if both of the governments did indicate that uh, the referendums were uh, to take place in, in the medium uh, future, that there would be a much greater level of unionist engagements and there'd be a much more, I suppose, an attractive and effective case made for uh, the continuation of the status quo, the union between Northern Ireland and Britain. So I'm sure it will come at some stage, but it would be helpful uh, if it was set out clearly and early on. Yeah. The, the problem I have with this, and why I mention unionism in particular, is, is because they... I've had some involvement in this, these various campaigns, as you well know, and I've had virtually no political reaction from unionism at all to what I've said or done. But I have had considerable reaction from what I would call ordinary unions, not particularly political people. And they're, they're, they're the people, I think, who would really be able to contribute usefully to the citizens' assembly. And I would, I would like to think that that would happen. I'm not quite sure how you would... Um, go about selecting the membership of a citizens' assembly, but it should contain all shades of opinion, obviously. And also, I, I would like to think that unionist politicians would actually engage with the ad hoc committee. I think that's absolutely vital. And uh, that's the possibility that, that they may uh, moderate their approach as it is at the moment and join in, because I think it would take both. But uh, and there's not particularly a question there, but I'd like to thank you again for coming before the committee. I think it's been very useful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Trevor. And I suppose maybe um, not not to, 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 to be announced as a defence, but I think it's fair enough to say that Doug Bailey is here. I assume that he is listening. The fact that he maybe isn't asking a question is his own choice, but he is here on, on the meeting. Uh, so just to, 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 I know that there was reference to there being no unionists here. The, look, the next final question then is from Emma Sheeran. So if we could ask Emma... Uh, to come up into the spotlight and let you have your questions, please, Emma. Thanks a million, Chair, and thanks to, to Colin and Mark for the presentation. I, I suppose the uh, pr presentation of the report, which covers an awful lot of what we've been talking about in terms of the approach to Irish reunification and the sensible way to to, to take this going forward. I would say at the outset that I really appreciate and welcome this uh, presentation this afternoon. And I think, you know, that in itself, the fact that the TEU committee has taken a presentation from two academics who have done work extensively on Irish reunification and how that is likely and could look and the opportunities that it presents to us is sort of groundbreaking and, you know, from where we are. And it just shows and demonstrates how mainstream this debate is now. And, you know, Trevor's contributions there are really welcome and what he's saying around ordinary unionists and people of a British identity engaging with him and asking questions and I think following on from what he said about the lack of unionist representation at the committee, I know that Doug is here um, notwithstanding that but we we have this this problem whereby and I think it was Martin McGuinness that said you know I am so confident in my Irish identity I have no need to, to question the British identity of others. And we have this frustrating sort of situation where we're trying to have a conversation about potential constitutional change. We're in a, a period of flux because of the events of the past number of years. And we don't have strong representation from unionists either to say, well, we're open to change and what would this look like and what can we do to be part of that or in defence of the status quo in defence of the union. I know Colin touched on that in terms of the potential outcomes here and, and none of this is guaranteed or inevitable, but we have to be around the table and having the conversation and it's it's sort of, it's a sad in, in, indictment on, on political unionism following on from even the remarks earlier on today around the North-South Ministerial Council that, you know, they're not coming to the table and having mature conversations. But I suppose from my perspective and what I wanted to ask you about, and the report does touch on this and lays it out and um, gestures towards sort of a rights-based approach and I know the report makes references to, you know, membership of the EU and the different rights that that um, allows for citizens of the North. But as and as as you'll know, and Martina has alluded to this, I'm the chair of the Bill of Rights Committee, and obviously as part of that work, we've been taking evidence around creating a Bill of Rights for the North, and it would be my perspective that a, a very sort of 
long reaching rights framework would be beneficial for us all and would be a good background for for this debate. And I wondered what you would say around that. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, I'm, I'm trying to say in response to your question, I agree. <laughs> and that's it. I think ultimately there should be a, a rights based approach uh, to, to, to this. Obviously, you withdraw from the European Union. Being outside the European Union has raised profound concerns from a quality and rights perspective. Uh, there's real worry about where uh, the UK might be going over the longer term, where um, the Westminster government might be might be going in relation to these particular areas. You'll be aware that in the protocol there is a no diminution protection, which doesn't get a lot of public attention in terms of, but it's actually there in terms of a, equality and rights. I think that the Bill of Rights debate at the moment is fundamentally important, and I think we still need a, a Bill of Rights uh, for uh, this region. I think also neglected is my view is because of the equivalence arrangements and the agreement any gains made in relation to equality and rights here now will be leveraged into the constitutional change discussion as well because you know there there must be at least an equivalent level of protection you know in the irish context as a result of that so i think that's an argument actually for getting a bill of rights in place in the here and now but was finally is that again there's a lot of talk particularly on the constitutional chain side, about this being a new debate and a new discussion. And it seems to me that, that if equality and human rights standards and protections aren't at the heart of that discussion, then it won't be a new debate. It'll be a very old debate. So I think there's, as you'll know, there, there is work going on at the moment to think about how equality and human rights standard standards can be brought to the heart of this discussion if it's going to be a genuinely new conversation. I think I would highlight something that, that, that maybe I should mention today and, and that really concerns me. You know, the premise for our discussion this afternoon in this committee is that this should be a rather unproblematic discussion that we're having, that people should be able to talk quite freely and openly about their constitutional objectives and preferences. But as we know, we live in a society in which that is categorically not the case at present. And I certainly detect an anxiety that people have in civil society about sharing their views about this particular issue. So in a small way, I hope that by my doing things like this, I'm encouraging other people to join in. But I'll get to the point I'm trying to make. I think equality and human rights organizations here need to be engaged in this discussion. They need not shy away from this conversation. If it's a genuine discussion about planning and preparing for all constitutional eventualities, then they also have to be ready for the constitutional change option as well. And if it's going to be a new discussion, uh, then human rights and equality need to be part of that. Just a final, final point of a habit of saying a final point and then adding one, but that also applies to those arguing for maintenance of the status quo. You know, what is the UK going to look like in the years ahead in terms of human rights and equality terms? If people are arguing that they want to make Northern Ireland work, you know, would a Bill of Rights be part of the project of making Northern Ireland work within the UK? So there are hard questions from an equality and rights perspective, perspective to, to all sides of the constitutional discussion. And I very much hope that they're a centre of all sides in the campaign that I think is coming around these referendums. So thank you, Emma. Thank you for the question. And just one small point I was going to add to, to what Colin has already said. Uh, very importantly, as, as mentioned, the, the equivalence provisions in the Good Friday Agreements. And, uh, there are a number of uh, provisions of Irish law, uh, principally Irish constitutional law, which confer uh, rights on Irish citizens uh, in, in the United Ireland. That's going to have to be revisited. It's going to have those rights are going to have to be available on an equal basis to Irish citizens and also to, to British citizens. And so part of the work that would have to be undertaken by the Irish government in, in the way in which the, the referendum for unity uh, is going to be pitched is to identify those uh, texts, changes to the Irish constitution that will have to be amended uh, on uh, unification. So a, uh, for instance, uh, 
the franchise for the uh, constitution is to Irish citizens residents in in I'm sorry, Mark. I think we've lost you again there, unfortunately. So, uh, regrettably, yeah, we, uh, we'll pass back to Emma. Do you have? Yeah, thanks. No, Mark broke up at the end there. Um, per connections, I think better broadband provision in the United Ireland is something we should all strive for. Uh, but I suppose, I suppose um, you know, you, it's largely been covered. Uh, I know when we're having this conversation, there's lots of things that people will say to you. And oftentimes I think people think that this is just about, you know, scrubbing away the border, adding six on to 26 and going from there. And it would be your party's perspective and my own perspective, certainly, that we need change north and south. And there are a lot of things that are currently sort of the status quo in the 26 counties that, that need to be changed. And when we're talking about rights, obviously, I think... Um, Mark was making the point there about extending the franchise and it would be my opinion that we should be looking at votes for, for 16 year olds. We should be looking at a diaspora abroad and how we encourage them to be part of the conversation, how we include them in terms of voting rights. I also think, you know, socioeconomic rights going forward. So, you know, healthcare free at the point of delivery, North and South um, and a, a healthcare model for for a new Ireland would be something that we should be working on and that I would I would welcome your thoughts on. But that's that's largely it for me. I just want to thank you again for the work and um for, for putting this conversation first and foremost and thank you. Could maybe just to respond there, Emma, to, to, to some of the things mentioned there about for example Scotland in relation to uh you know who can vote and voting age uh, is is showing the way, you know, in relation to 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 that particular issue. And just to follow up on something Marcus said, you know, the, the Good Friday Agreement requires things and will require things of the Irish state and the Irish government. So I suppose one of the questions that raises is why wait? Why wait for constitutional change if it's clear that aspects of Irish constitutional law Various law policy and practice need to change. Well, you know, a start could be made now in terms of the accommodations that would anticipate uh, possible change uh, too. So that's important and that's already clear in the agreement. I suppose it's, it's slightly tangential, but just to also mention that, you know, there's a lot of concern at the moment. You'll know there's an independent review of the Human Rights Act happening in the UK context, and there's a lot of worry there. Uh, about what the uh, Westminster government might do. And, and I don't need to tell any members of the committee just how important uh, the Human Rights Act is and just how important the European Convention on Human Rights is to both the agreement and to this society. So, you know, as part of the debate around change here, you know, part of it is motivated by the sense in which uh, Brexit is creating a dynamic that will create a very, very cold house indeed for human rights and equality in the UK in the years ahead, and people are, are perhaps looking to a different and better way forward uh, based around some of the human rights and equality protections that you've talked about. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that, um, Colin and Mark. That ends the questions that we have from members. I um, appreciate that the line wasn't great for yourself there, Mark, but we did get some contributions from you, which are appreciated. Uh, members do have the report in their pack, and I'm sure have read it uh, in advance of the meeting, but can refer back to it. And I have no doubt that we will uh, be engaging in some conversations again in the future. But can I thank both of you for giving us your time this afternoon? Uh, it's greatly appreciated and thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, committee members. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you to the committee also. Okay, members, if I can ask those that are remaining just to stay with us so that we've got the five members just to get us through about another five minutes worth and then that will be us uh, concluded. Um, so... Uh, just are there any actions that anybody wants to take as a result of that? Uh, Emma, go on ahead. 
Chair, sorry, I was just going to ask as a suggestion, I know that Mark in particular raised some points there around Irish government sort of responsibilities from the Good Friday Agreement and things that they should be doing. We know obviously the Shared Island Unit and all of that. Is there is there scope for this committee to write to Irish government and ask for sort of an update on actions and whether or not we can have some engagement on that following from the following on from the presentation that we have had today? Yeah, I'm I'm sure that would be possible. Yeah, we can we can do that. We can write to them, and then um, when we get the response, we can we can uh, decide from there. Yeah, okay, okay, members, thank you very much. Uh, Martina, Martina, yes, go ahead. Well, I'm just wondering what we intend to do with the recommendation with regards to writing to the executive office to see in the atmosphere that we're all living in now and the different constitutional per perspectives that people have, all of us entitled to them all, uh, what work, if any, is being done around planning and preparing or research that's going in um, about like what union you want to be part of, it, if it's staying here, what work's being done to encourage people along that pathway, or if it's about looking to rejoin the EU and how that can be done. I mean, just to get a handle, if anything is being done, Okay, yeah, we can make that request and get get the update. I'm not so sure that will be a response that will be signed off on both sides of the houses, but we can certainly ask it. Um, okay, so thank you very much, members. Then what we'll do, we'll move on then, please, to item 7, which is the forward work programme at page 199 of the meeting pack. Um, the committee has been approached to meet with the Eructus Joint Committee on EU Affairs. Contact is ongoing between the two clerks uh, prior to the formal invitation, which we hope will be issued um, maybe tomorrow or on Friday. So we'll have that um, date set hopefully with us for next week. Um, there is a climate change bill, which is moving to the second stage uh, on the... 4th of May, although I think it's maybe been delayed by a week. Uh, it does contain significant provisions uh, which are relating to our committee or to, to the TEO department. So um, the views of the committee will be sought. I was maybe going to suggest in the first instance that we invite the bill um, sponsor, which is Claire Bailey, maybe along to the committee at some stage to give us some background. And also then there may be a request for maybe we could ask for the committee, uh, for the TEO officials, who I think are also preparing a similar bill, uh, but we maybe could get them along because there are quite a number of the work streams will be within the executive office. So I think if we were to get appraised of that, we would be getting a head start any work that might be required there. Uh, members in agreement to that? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you content to note the rest of the forward work programme? Okay, members, item eight in correspondence uh, to inform members there are 11 members, 11, oh, I can nearly speak today, 11 items of correspondence at page 207 to 328 in the meeting pack. Item 8.1 is a response from the First and Deputy First Minister um, assuring the committee that they are committed to engagement with young people. Um, the request for that letter rose after we met with young people from the Northern Ireland Youth Forum. So could I have permission from the committee to forward that response to the Northern Ireland Youth Forum for their uh, views? Yeah. Okay. Item 8.6 is from the Committee for the Economy suggesting that at our joint meeting that we also have representatives from the Finance Committee uh, for that meeting that is set on the 16th of June. So I'm going to suggest that we write to the Committee for the Economy supporting their invitation to the Committee for Finance to take part in that concurrent meeting. Um, it really does cut across a number of the committees So, uh, and I have, I have sought assurances that a sort of tripartite meeting of committees has taken place before, so it's something that we will be able to do and to handle. But are members content with that? Yep. Uh, we received a response from the department on their spending plans for 2021-22. There has been an additional £12 million um, that had been required for the shared future funding, so that is indeed very welcome that it's been received. Um, although I'm going to suggest now that we've got the response from the, uh, the officials that we ask them uh, to come to the committee to give a presentation so that we can then prepare the submission that we will give to the Finance Committee. 
Uh, members will note that the last time we didn't get this paper in time, uh, now that we've got it with plenty of time, we should maybe ask the officials up just to, to engage with them on that and then prepare a response that goes to the Finance Committee. Would members be agreeable to that? Yeah. Okay. And are members uh, content to note the rest of the correspondence or is there any items that they wish to raise? Okay. Um, any other business? Um, I think it would probably just would be amiss not to uh, mention that while we've been in committee, that the First Minister has uh, resigned from, um, or has offered her resignation as leader of the DUP by the end of uh, May and will step down as First Minister of the department that we scrutinised by the end of June. So that process, I'm sure, will uh, be undertaken during the weeks ahead and that there will be a, another minister there for us to uh, invite up and use our honed uh, skills on at some point in the future. Um, Trevor, you were looking in there? Uh, yes, Chair. I, I just wanted to actually apologise to Doug Beatty because uh, when I was being a wee bit hard on the unionism earlier on, I meant the DUP, let's be honest. And I'm well aware that Doug has engaged in these meetings with Southern representatives already in the last few months, which is to his credit. So, Doug, I didn't mean I wasn't talking about you. I'm sorry about that. No concerns, mate. Don't worry. That's fine. I certainly, Trevor, would echo the remarks that you make there that Doug has engaged in places and, and, and that certainly is, has always been very well received and, and, and uh, thank him for that. So, members, if, there's no, uh, if there isn't any other business, we'll leave it there. The date, time and place of the next meeting is next Wednesday at 2 o'clock. There's a bank holiday long weekend for members in between time, so enjoy that, and I look forward to catching up with people next week. But thank you. We'll call the quits there. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.